All right, so thank you everyone for joining us. We're gonna go ahead and get started with this session of Illini Arrow Connections. Um, for those of you that are new, um, Illini Arrow Connections is a series that we began a couple of years ago to help bridge that gap between um, what you're taught in your courses and what you need to know for um, life out in the aerospace industry. So tonight's session is networking and negotiations, and this session um, is specifically to talk about how you can navigate um, career fair and interviews, um, job prospects, and things like that. So um, it's it's actually to prepare you for a new event we have coming up next month, the AE Industry Meetup. And I will talk a little bit more about that at the end of this session. So right now I'm gonna turn it over to Samantha McHugh. Samantha is a um, AE alum who has helped develop this program. Um, she has great insight and always um, helps moderate these sessions and just does a terrific job. So thank you so much, Samantha. And I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Perfect, thank you, Courtney. Um, I'm really excited about this one. Um, I did graduate from UIUC in 2012 and got my first job because of networking with someone probably many of you know, um, Mike Lembeck. So uh, this works, uh, I'm testament to that. I currently am a systems engineering manager um, for a company called 5D Systems Kratos. Uh, we do cradle the grave systems engineering. So I get to do everything from design work all the way to leading and directing flight tests uh, for unmanned uh, military systems. Um, with that, I'd like to pass it over to our uh, different people in the room to introduce themselves. And uh, Tracy, let's start with you. Hello everyone, my name's Tracy Elving. Um, I'm the president of the alumni board for U of I Aerospace Engineering. I graduated in 1985. I would hazard a guess that I might be the elder statesman on uh, the call today. Um, we're excited to host this event. Sam and Courtney have done a great job. And as Courtney said, we'll talk more at the end of this conversation about the industry meetup, um, kind of first of its kind. So we'll talk about that. And really um, what I would encourage this afternoon, ask lots of questions. Um, we've put together a really great diverse um, panel in terms of um, industry experience, what they do, what they work on. So really take advantage of that. Um, we'd love as much participation as we can get. So I'd encourage that as you go forward, enjoy the next hour. Awesome, and Derek. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Derek Smith. I graduated from U of I in 91. Uh, so not too far after Tracy. Um, I, uh, my path uh, as I graduated and was going to, uh, was interested in actually, and was planning on working on the space station, I ended up going on and getting my graduate's degree in business administration, and then ended up going into consulting, and I currently am a consultant in the high tech space in, in Silicon Valley. Thank you, and Alfred. Hey everyone, my name is Alfred Tang. I graduated with my bachelor's degree uh, in 2012. And I currently work at Aer uh, Collins Aerospace as a senior research engineer, and more specifically in uh, composite from plastic composites. Uh, so I, I started off as a design engineer doing uh, aircraft seating uh, at another company. And then I got hired on by uh, what was then BE. And then after several mergers, it became uh, Collins Aerospace. And then I ran through several uh, career changes, and then now I'm, uh, I found something I'm passionate in, and that is uh, doing research for composite. So, yeah. Perfect. And Jonathan? Good evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan Igartua. I'm a fleet engineer um, on the power plant team at United Airlines, I'm currently in Chicago in the Willis Tower. Um, Pretty much graduating with my bachelor's in aerospace in 2017. Uh, after that, was a design engineer, uh, then an application engineer, then a manufacturing engineer. Um, the whole time, pretty much wanted to be at United, so I just kept building up my experience, and uh, now we're here. Perfect. And Jenny. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenny Collins. I graduated from U of I in 2013. 
Uh, similar to Derek, I went into consulting. After I graduated, I went to Washington, D.C., where I did aerospace and defense consulting. I ended up going back to grad school after a few years at MIT, where I got a master's in aeroastro and an MBA. Uh, while I was at MIT, I co-founded a company in high-performance satellite electronics. Uh, we got some government contracts and some venture funding, but uh, it happened all during the pandemic, so I decided to leave, and now I'm at Raytheon Technologies, where I help supervise and manage a satellite electronics factory. Awesome. Okay, so I definitely encourage you guys as we ask questions here of our panelists, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat and we'll try to kind of answer them as they happen or feel free to, you know, uh, pipe in with your voice, whatever you prefer. Um, Derek, let's start with you and, and start kind of general um, when we're, we're talking about talking with company representatives or rec recruiters. Um, what are what do you think the approach should be and, and kind of what do people forget when they're interacting with someone like that for the first time? Yeah, I think kind of a good general rule of thumb is uh, is to, to take on more of the, the context that you're entering their house. And so often people forget just at first general manners. Thank you. Uh, thank you for meeting with me today. It's nice to meet you. Just a, a cordial greeting as you would do if somebody was inviting you over, say, for the holidays. So I think first, just remember that manners matter. The interview starts as soon as they see you. So obviously there's professional presence that you want to bring to it. And we'll probably talk more about this on the panel. But as far as that, those, those, the initial meeting goes and the context, consider yourself in their house. So remember your manners. Other than that, remember being focused and being human. So we, we quite often have a, a, a take where some folks want to hop right into it. They're very nervous and it's normal to be, to be nervous. But just be human about it and, and take a minute to just say, how, how is their day? There's something that you have. There are two things that you have when you go into these discussions that they don't know. One, they don't know you, but they want to know your story. So that's an advantage and try and use that to calm, calm things down because they're there to get to meet you just as much as you're get there to get to meet them. The other thing is they're new often to the campus as well. So if you want that icebreaker to say, you know, how are you doing today? You can also say, are you enjoying our campus? Are you finding things okay around the campus? Because they're also visiting your home to some extent as well. So you can use that as a little bit of an icebreaker to get kind of a commonality um, with them, a common ground, if you will, with them before you go into your interview. And I think sometimes, especially yeah. nowadays, right, we, we hear these stories about like, a student that did something wild and got the job because they they stood out to some extreme level and those are the stories that maybe make the news or social media right but what do you what do you think is a professional way to stand out without doing something crazy right or, or how can how can they approach that to be unique when there's thousands of students all over the country looking for for jobs and internships so so during the conversation i i think that there are hooks that you're looking for there there, there are hooks that you're looking for as you're you come in with your questions, you're asking questions, they're asking questions about you. There are gonna be some hooks that you're looking for in an area that you're interested in, an area of, um, of focus uh, that the, the company has. Those, the, the, the hook that you're, those one or two hooks, and you're looking for at least one or two that tie to your interest or differentiate you, those are gonna be part of your follow-up email afterwards, your follow-up reach out to say, it was very nice meeting you, and you're going to hint to those or mention those directly in your follow-up email so that they can make that connection with you, even an email. So beyond the walls of U of I, if you will. Um, so, so look for those. Sometimes they can be in the, on the casual side, they can be the common, hey, that person's from the same city I'm from or from the same town that I'm in. And it's just making a, a, a part of that can be the icebreaker in the email when you go back. Another piece of that could be you know, in the, if you're interested in a particular uh, discipline and we were talking about things like systems engineering and they've introduced you or to a systems engineer or you spoke to them or they happen to be a systems engineer, making a tie to what your interest is there. You know, a lot of people even nowadays when they're applying for colleges to differentiate themselves are reaching out to professors ahead of time that have an interest of the, the area of study that they want. I remember when I was uh, applying to U of I, I actually went down to U of I and I interviewed some professors. I asked them, where did they go for undergrad? What was their road to getting to their, their doctorate degree? 
And so when I when I was applying to, to U of I, it gave me an opportunity to reach back to some of those professors and thank them. And they remembered, oh, you were the curious kid that came down and actually interviewed me. So uh, make those connections. Look for them in the discussion. And do you think, I mean, can you give some examples that you've said, like, look for those hooks? Um, and sometimes that's hard, right? Sometimes we can find them because you connect with something maybe as you're doing your research or the person that you're talking to. But do you have some ideas for just kind of some general questions that might be appropriate to ask of a recruiter if you don't have, you can't find the hook or you couldn't do the research to really get something unique? Yeah. So I, I think there are a few ways that you can approach it. Um, one area is, is you're sharing with the recruiter your interest. I'm interested in this. Can you share a little bit more with me? What's that like at company XYZ? It gives them an opportunity to go in, in kind of a day in the life. If you find that that recruiter is not familiar or is giving you an overview, but you want more, then you can follow up and say, is there somebody perhaps at company XYZ I could talk to to get more information? Now they're giving you the names of folks. Now you've also got a hook on someone you can follow up with. Thank you, recruiter, for meeting with me earlier this week. I, as follow-up, you mentioned to me that you would connect me with someone in systems engineering or whatever the discipline is. Uh, I would appreciate it if you could make that connection. This is just a reminder. And so they, they share that contact information with you, forwarding your email or, or whatever it may be. So that's, that's one thing when you want to dig deeper. Uh, another area that you can look for a, a hook, because the recruiter, recruiters sometimes can give a good overview of the company, but you want to go deep on the areas that you're in. So again, to ask kind of what's that life like? What's Can you give me a little bit of day in the life of what a systems engineer, I keep on picking that as just an example, uh, at your company, uh, it, it usually pushes to go deeper and to get a connection with someone, which is a hook. But then there's also opportunities for you to um, look for other aspects. So um, if you want to know with their company, what is um, what is diversity inclusion like at your company? I'd love to talk to someone in your HR department that's focused on that area. Or are there uh, are there interest groups at your company? How could I get to know more about those interest groups? Or or how do you guys handle? So where, wherever there is a an area of interest, you want to push that recruiter for another connection, and that is a hook. Right. There are lighter hooks that you can go with, as I mentioned earlier. Oh, you remember we, we're from the, you don't say, you remember we're from the same hometown, but you say, hey, this is Derek, you know, reaching out to you from Pinckneyville, Illinois. I just wanted to thank you for, you can make those connections, but you want to push to get beyond the recruiter as much as you can. Does that help? And Derek, yeah, it does. And we had a follow-up question in the chat. They said, how do you go beyond that initial pleasantries to starting the meat of the conversation? You know, how do you do it without sounding like you're jumping the gun and, and trying to just force the, <laughs> the conversation? So you, you, you be, this is where you have an opportunity to be really nice and transparent. So you started off with the pleasantries. You said, you know, um, thank you for meeting with me today. How are you finding your time here at U of I as well? This is your first time on our campus. There's that. Then you go to, you know, I'm really excited and was looking forward for my time with you here today. And I, and I, I, I have a few questions that I, I, I just would like to run by you. So it sets up, I'm going to jump into it now, right? But you're putting your excitement behind it. That excitement by letting them know that you're excited for this opportunity. One, it lets you know that you're looking forward to meeting them. Two, if you're a little bit nervous, it's okay because you're going to turn that nervousness into the excitement of having the discussion with them versus you feeling like you're under the microscope. And then you get you have the opportunity to go rapid fire from there. Boom, 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 boom. Ask your questions. And it's also okay to say, is, is that okay? So it, it, in other words, I'm excited to be here today. I, I was really looking forward to this discussion. I have a few questions that I'd like to run by, by you. Is it appropriate to do that now, or did you want to did you want to cover a few other things before before I I ask my questions? And they can say no, that's fine. Let's go. Boom, go for it. Help them set the agenda. One thing that you should do, we didn't just to, as you get into these discussions, is you want to be recognize the time you have. So if you go in knowing that you're going to have questions and you kind of in your mind have that agenda, I'm going to go in, I'm going to do my greetings, I'm going to be human, I'm not going to be a robot. And then I, I want to be able to ask them my questions. Put that agenda out there. 
put that agenda that, hey, after the pleasantries, I, 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 there's some questions I wanted to ask. You know, are there any other topics that you feel that we should discuss uh, and questions that you may have for me? So you understand what you're working with. So as you're going through that time, did we cover it? You can, you're making mental note. Did they ask their questions? They said they had questions about my, my, my CV or what have you. Yes, we did that. Now I've got questions about the company. Did we cover that? Yes. So you keep that agenda at, in mind as you move forward. Yeah, and I think that's really important, right? So, so there's kind of sometimes we know how much time we're going to get, and it's, it's maybe 60 seconds, 90 seconds, couple of minutes. Sometimes it's informal. We might get to talk to an alum for 10, 20 minutes. We don't realize maybe that could be a potential interview that five years from now that person's going to reach out because they remember that conversation. Um, and so, continuing to ask questions and and show interest in what they're involved in is a big part of just networking in general, right? I think the, my, my the, some of the best advice I ever got was. People love talking about themselves, so keep asking them about themselves, and that's what they're going to remember, right? They're going to remember that you were a great listener, but the truth is you just took interest in, in, in them rather than spending all the time talking about yourself. And that's not always possible, but I think when you when you think about you've never said, hey, I'd love to talk to you about your job, and someone says, no, I don't want to do that, <laughs> you know, unless they can't for security reasons or something like that. So I think that's important when you're thinking about how much time you have with someone. Um, Alfred, I think this is kind of... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's also okay to ask them if you get in a situation where you're not sure of how much time you have to say, hey, how much time do we have? It's okay to say that too. And guess what? If you don't get through all your questions and you set the, 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 the foundation for I've got questions and you don't get to, that's your hook. That's your follow-up. Hey, I know we ran out of time, but I had some follow-up questions. And, and if appropriate for them to, to do the follow-up with them, you can say, hey, do you have time? Uh, is there a time we can follow up? Or that referral to somebody who maybe is more focused in the discipline that you're interested in. Sorry, Samantha. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And, and I think this next kind of segue into this next piece of it that we wanted to have Alfred talk about is the very limited amount of time interaction. And for me, this was always the hardest one. So Maybe you only get time to hand off your resume and spend a minute to two minutes with the recruiter. I think that's kind of what we want to talk about next. So, um, Alfred, if you could kind of take this question, what, what do you think students should think about when they're coming up with that very brief elevator pitch um, and talking to someone for the first time? Yeah, so um, so most of you will go to the career fair at some point, you know, um, just imagine you're, if you're the recruiter, you have to talk to, I don't know, 100 people, maybe not, if not 200. You, you're gonna have a little, very little attention span by the end of the day. So I think from their side, you know, how, what you can do to, you know, try to get their attention. Um, you know, most of the time you only get, you know, as Samantha said, you know, one to two minutes to talk to the recruiter. So start off with a very, you know, good confident handshake. Uh, I've, I've, you know, I've met so many people who, you know, give a really like, you know, mild handshake that, you know, doesn't give me a kind of, you know, confidence that they should have, right? So, you know, if you can impress them, you know, with a very confident handshake, that's a very good way to start. Um, yeah, now going to your elevator pitch. And I think that, um, you know, it's very important to that you sell yourself and know the audience who you're trying to sell to. Um, so to that, to that point, you should do a research. For example, I, I'm a composite engineer, right? So if I'm trying to um, talk to a company that's, um, you know, focus on composites, then I really want to you know, dig into the technical details. Uh, if I'm talking to someone who is from, uh, say, software background, then maybe I want to focus on my soft skills. So really try to understand your audience, do your research on the company that you are trying to um, talk to. And uh, one good way that I've learned you now in the past uh, year or two is the, your personal branding. Well, what is it that when people see like, Alfred Tang, what, what is it that stands out? Um, you know, when you see the sign for McDonald's, you, that, you know that they're selling you know, fries, burgers, right? So you want to give, you know, in that short period of time, what, say, for example, what, you know, in 30 seconds, what Alpha 10 stands for, what kind of skills, technical skills, what kind of, um, you know, professional skills, what some soft skills that Alpha 10 stands for in that um, uh, 30 seconds. So 
really, you know, present, uh, share your skills, uh, keep it brief, uh, mention what you want to do. Uh, and then uh, if you have your resume printed out, you know, have handed over if you're, if you're in the middle of your career, you know, to give you a business card. So, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And, and what do you think as far as if you only have a couple minutes, maybe, you know, and you only have time to ask one or two questions, uh, what do you think are the important questions in that time to, to ask to a com company representative? Yeah. So again, uh, do your research, um, you know, understand, really understand what your career interests are, um, understand what you're um, trying to look for in the company. And this is very open-ended question. So if it is, it's, uh, it is not like a specific question that I can give it to you, but understand your career interests and understand what the company is doing. And I think uh, with that, you will know um, what you can expect from your boss and what you can, ex what your boss can expect from you too. So, um, so yeah, that's what the advice I would give for um, to students. Perfect. Yeah. And so let's talk about now we have a little bit more time. Um, Jonathan, you know, let's say we, we might get five minutes, 10 minutes with someone. Uh, so we're not rushing through that speech. What kinds of things and how would you expand upon what Alfred just talked about um, in, a, in a longer format interaction? Yeah, so Alfred mentioned, uh, you know, being prepared. Um, I think if you have more time with a company, then you have more time to elaborate more on some of the, the things that you want to work on maybe. Um, like uh, when I was applying for United, one of the things that I brought up during the elevator pitch, uh, you know, in the beginning of the interview was, oh, I, I bought a plane with my cousin during the pandemic. Um, and then that allowed me to then bring up other aspects of working for United, dealing with um, aviation operations and, and anything else that you want to bring up. So, think of it less as you know ask you asking questions and more as you kind of guiding the conversation in the way that you want to go so try to bring things up uh, that you've worked on that you're passionate about that allow your passion to shine through and the conversation should be able to to kind of guide itself in that regard and this is a question i'll just kind of ask anyone on the panel is welcome to kind of answer this one um i find when i get resumes in and then we go go to do an interview or I have a first interaction you know I often say hey tell me a little bit about yourself um and I've probably already looked at their resume or I'm looking at it as they're talking um what are your thoughts on should you be telling them what's on your resume or should you be telling them things beyond that resume because the person already has that piece of paper in their hand you know what 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 are we saying versus what is that person looking at And Jonathan, if you have thoughts on it, go yeah. for it. And pass it around. <laughs> so yeah, I'll go uh, for that one. So yeah. I, I always consider the, you know, tell me about yourself question while they're looking at the resume as a way for you to fill in the blanks between, you know, anything, any line items you might have on the resume, because you have maybe one, you know, if you're further along in your career, two pages to actually put stuff on there that you want to discuss. Um, so, you know, if you want to talk about things that are not on the resume that are very important to you or that you think they would might want to hear, that is the time for you to put that information out. I, I completely agree. So the, the you know, the, the resume is black and white. You, you have a rare opportunity to bring it to life. That's why it's a shame at, at career fairs when you see people walk around and they hand the resume out like it's a leaflet. It's like a lean back conversation. They start by handing out the resume as opposed to presenting, leaning themselves. And so I, I think you, you present yourself, you, 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 you bring to life. It's not you're reading the resume. This is not the news and you're reading some teleprompter. This is, is you bringing to life your story and sharing your story. As Alfred mentioned, sharing, showing your brand, as Jonathan mentioned, things that are of interest to you. And then the, the resume helps tie all those things together. Right. It, it's really nice when you're when you have the opportunity to sit down and you're having the interview. And as you're bringing it to life, as you're sharing your brand, what you want them to see is them taking notes on your resume. Not that they're leaning back either, but they're leaning forward and they're taking notes on, oh, you bought a plane with your with your cousin. Oh, that's very cool. Ah, I see. That's why it got you interested in this part. It ties the story together. So that's why you're interested in, in this discipline. 
So make it a lean in experience for both parties. Yeah, I would also suggest um, uh, if you have any visual, you know, anything visual, like a photo, um, you can bring along as long as it's not like proprietary that you're not supposed to show. Um, you know, anything visual is better than uh, words, uh, as I, you know, you know, as an engineer would think. So, uh, yes, I mean, if, it could be very quick, right? Hey, you know, I, I work on this project. Hey, here is also a photo of it, you know, take a look. And then it would give a better impression than, you know, just words. Yeah, and that I, I also allows it, them, go ahead. Sorry, I, I just was gonna say one thing I think folks underestimate, your energy during an interview, whether it's an elevator pitch, whether it's a little bit more time talking to, uh, talking to a recruiter or whether it's a formal interview, your, your energy carries the day. Your energy is the, is the difference between them hiring somebody who just signed up to somebody who truly wants to be on their team. So bring the energy. And I'll, I'll give you another little tip. Let's say you apply uh, at a, a job fair, you apply uh, and, and you don't get, you don't make the list. They can only take so many people to interview. And so you're now going to go by the booth and you're going to drop off your resume. You're going to try and do that elevator pitch and get somebody interested. Two things. One, offer to take them to lunch. If your excitement is strong enough and you say, I really was looking forward to an interview and I know you can only meet so many people, but by chance, do you have a, are you available for lunch? I've had recruiters when I was at U of I, the, the, the energy, I met with JPL over lunch. They could only take so many students, but here I am saying, I'm really interested. Boom, let's go. I'm having lunch. The other thing is Samantha gave you a key. Samantha said they love to talk about themselves. So when you only have a few minutes and have them start to talk about themselves, they're going to run over. Not only are they going to run over, but they're going to offer to give you more time. They're going to pick up the phone and they're going to tell their spouse, there is this person at U of I that was actually interested in what I do. And they're going to take a mentoring perspective with you. And they're going to say, this is an opportunity for me not to just get back by going to a job fair. This is giving me an opportunity to mentor somebody. I am definitely calling that person. Bring the energy. Sorry, Jonathan. Oh, no worries. You got the energy for sure. <laughs> um, a... I was going to say, um, you know, when, like Alfred had mentioned, bringing photos, bringing anything, you know, like if you are in, in an informal meeting with someone, uh, with a recruiter, with an alum who's got five to 10 minutes, you know, pull out your phone and, and show them some of these projects, obviously not in an interview, but, you know, if you can do that, if you can show them some projects and your passion about what you're working on and, you know, an issue that you might have had uh, dealing with a fuel nozzle on your plane that you bought, you know, you can walk them through that process and your thought process and that right there, they already know, wow, this, this guy's got an engineering mindset, you know, he can solve problems on the fly, he can talk about things that he did to someone who's, who doesn't know what, you know, a fuel nozzle on, on an aircraft would be, um, use every opportunity that you have to set yourself apart. Yeah, so we have some really good questions coming in the chat. So I'm going to deviate it just a little bit. Um, the first one is, and it's very related to what we're talking about, how do you sound interested without sounding like you're sucking up um, to, to that person or, you know, that you're overly interested? Um, I don't know who might want to take that one. Uh, I'll start with Samantha. I mean, I think we're... We're all, we all understand what's going on here. You're looking for a job. So, you know, it's not like, you know, we're out for a nice lunch. It's, oh my gosh, this person's looking for a job. So, I mean, we all understand the pretenses under which we're talking. So I think it's hard to really come across like you're sucking up. Um, really, you just, it's exactly what the other speakers have been saying. It's showing that you're passionate, um, like Alfred was saying, showing that you've done your research on the company, uh, that you understand what the company does and how you would fit into it. So I think you can strike that balance of passion and interest in the company um, during these interactions. And we, you know, we understand you're looking for a job and we're not here pretending that, you know, you're trying to be our, our BFFs. We understand you're looking for a job. So just finding, like, uh, like Derek was saying too, uh, getting that rapport with the recruiter, asking questions, being passionate and uh, understanding what exactly the company is doing. And I think that you're on the right path.
And then what about some specific advice for freshmen? Um, I think this is huge, right? People always think I'm a freshman. I, I don't know what I can do or can't do and what the rules are. I'm curious, um, you know, maybe Derek or, or Jonathan, what do you guys think about that as giving those that specific group some advice? So I, I think your, your, um, your, your job search, your, your, your career, your career path, it started as soon as you started to sit next to your classmate as a freshman. Your network started. Your network started before then in high school, but to be more specific around your discipline, it started there. So building not only your, your there's looking at recruiters, yes, but also building your network around, amongst your classmates, understanding what other folks share like interest in, future projects that you might be working on together, opportunities to collaborate about upcoming internships, Start making those connections now. Those connections become a net. So when there's opportunities for job fairs, when somebody hears of something going out, that, that is your own beginning of your own little LinkedIn of staying connected. Second, when it comes to, to uh, your freshman and, and maybe a feeling, you go for this, the internships. This is not only do people like to talk about themselves, but believe it or not, there are folks out there that really take a liking to mentoring folks. And so for, for you to, to still be going to those job fairs, to be looking for those internships online, showing that you've got deep interest in an area, you may not have developed a certain skill set yet in a discipline. It may be a little bit more sweat equity right now, but that goes a long way. And being able to say to somebody that I've got that sweat equity, I'm willing to put in the hard work because I want to learn and they're willing to mentor you, those lead to internships. So, so don't think, hey, I've got to wait until I'm a sophomore or a junior. It starts today. As a matter of fact, you've got something that the sophomores and the juniors don't have, and that's more time. That's more time to explore discussions here, to explore discussions there. Take advantage of the time. Yeah, to yeah, add absolutely. to that, um, just really quick, as a freshman, um, how many times out of the year do you have to go talk to real life engineers or real, you know, anyone who works at a company that you might want to work at um, other than at career fair. So don't skip out on that. I know a lot of freshmen when I was in school, um, you know, they didn't want to go to career fairs because they were worried about not having, you know, the background and whatever skill set the job might be looking for, but that's your opportunity to go talk to those people who are doing those jobs and to ask them, you know, this is what I want to do. This is the path that I'm thinking that I might need to take. You know, if you, even if you have five minutes because there's a line of 15 people behind you, um, that's your start. And like Derek said, you get to start earlier than other people who might be sophomores or juniors. Yeah, I want to uh, pick up on that point. You know, uh, don't be afraid that you don't have the skill set for an internship. You know, I my, my team, I had, we had um, two interns this summer. I mean, I, I talked to them quite a lot of things. So, you know, they may not have necessarily have the skill sets, but people will teach you once you uh, land on the internships. And, uh, and also for internships, uh, make sure you apply early. Most of the uh, internship hiring cycle is, uh, I think, as early as September. So they're already uh, starting to, you know, fill up the internship for the next summer. So uh, definitely start um, looking around, do your research, and uh, apply for internship. And, and from my experience, it's not a guarantee, but a lot of the interns do become uh, full-time hires. And, and I'm not speaking just you know, for my company and in, in, in industry as a whole, right? Um, you know, a lot of the interns do become full-time hires. And uh, even if you're not trying to get into the industry, if you are trying to do uh, research uh, for, for postdoc, uh, sorry, uh, postgrad or whatever, um, you know, try to look for, you know, labs or whatever, you know, research opportunities in the summer. I think one thing to consider, can you imagine, let's put ourselves in the, in the, in the, in the seat of a recruiter and, and you're, you're a senior and you're coming up and you're having a, you're looking for an interview and it, you, you, you're doing everything you can to differentiate yourself. And 99% of the people who are there are in the same boat you are, or they're a junior. But can you imagine what it's like when they when they when they debrief at the end of the night or at the end of the week? They say, "Oh, here we met this guy, Derek. He came for an interview. He's going to be a graduating senior, and all the stuff we're talking about differentiating. We're looking for did Derek show those things?" But then, can you imagine the other story? 
can you imagine when they're debriefing at the end of the night or the end of the week and they say, hey, we met with Derek. And they go, Derek, the guy who's been talking to us for the last three years? Yeah, let's put him at the top of the list. As a freshman, you have an opportunity to start building that now. It's okay as the freshman if he didn't get the interview. What you wanted it, what you want is the business card. What you want is the contact. What you want is to be able to say, hey, thank you for, you know, I'm a freshman. I'm really interested in your company. Thank you so much for spending a little time with me, even though it may have been the, the, the drive-by, the few, few minutes standing up. But to follow up the next year, for them to see that interest means something. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and I try to knock out a couple of these together because they're semi-related. One is, you know, what are recruiters looking for? That's a big question. But I think kind of a sub part of that question is if I don't fit the exact mold, maybe if they're, you know, if they're propulsion engineers and I've never really done anything, what do I say? Is that okay? Can I, can my passion and willingness to learn stand out? And should I still go talk to that person or that company if they're into something that I'm not? you know, haven't had a direct experience or leadership with in the past, what's the advice for, for talking to recruiters and what they're looking for in these kind of maybe off nominal situations? I'm, I was trying to give other people a chance, but I'm happy to hop in. I'm, I'm on the West Coast, so I can talk to you guys all night. I, um, I think, um, uh, uh, this is the perfect scenario. Yes, you should go talk to them to answer the question. Yes, you absolutely should. How do you approach it? This is the perfect scenario of, of the, the, the getting them to talk about themselves. So if, if they're a propulsion engineer and you're interested in propulsion, how did you, I'm interested, how did you get started? How did you make that connection out of, out of when you graduated? What was your path? Can you share that path with me? Right. And, and as you get them to start talking about it, you're going to start to realize that the concerns and fears that you have aren't as big as you think. And they're going to give you the breadcrumbs to get to where you want to go. In that conversation, as they share with you, you can bring out as appropriate things that might be a little bit more unique to your situation. Right. Hey, you know, uh, if I didn't get a chance to do that particular class my junior year, is that something that you would recommend my senior year? Or is that something that uh, you can pick up in an internship? And if they say, oh, actually, we do this with our interns all the time, then guess what you're going to ask next? How do I go about getting an internship? So this is perfect to Samantha's earlier point about getting them to talk about themselves, and it'll help uh, give you the guidance. Um, that you're looking for. I'm going to piggyback on that just because you said propulsion and I technically do that now. So um, I did not have uh, design engineering or manufacturing engineering experience on engines. I didn't work at GE. Um, but the great thing about aerospace is everything kind of interconnects, you know, everything's a system, right? So if you don't know about, you know, engine operations or anything like that, maybe you know about seal design like I, I was working my prior job i was designing seals for engines maybe you you know you might be curious about how uh vibration on an engine can affect the structure of the aircraft you know there's other ways that you can spin it to show your interest um to show that you're willing to learn and you know that that's a conversation opener right there Um, I want to direct one question to Jenny because you've got a pretty diverse background. Someone asked, is it bad to talk to a recruiter if you're not really interested in either their company or what they do just to try to get your name out there more? Um, curious about your thoughts having done grad school, done different things, now been in industry. What do you think about that? I don't think it's ever bad to talk to people. I think you need to understand what your goal is with the conversation. Are you just trying to understand more about their experience, what their path was, if you're not interested in their company, or maybe you don't know as much about their company as you think that you do, and there is an opportunity for you to learn more. Um, companies like Raytheon, um, you know, which owns Collins, they're huge 100,000 um, people corporations. So I think kind of assuming like, oh, I'm not interested in that company at all, maybe isn't a good way to approach it. You would say, 
hey, you know, maybe at first glance, I don't think this is something that I'm interested in. But if I have the opportunity to talk to this person more and more, maybe I'll find a piece of that company that I am interested in and that I, you know, could see myself being a part of. Um, so I don't think it's ever bad to talk to someone, understand your intentions with them. And I would say, especially when you're in school, just try to keep a really open mind. Try not to go in with a, with a closed mind saying, hey, I'm not interested in this at all. I think there are some scenarios where, uh, you know, if you know, absolutely no, uh, you know, I don't want to do uh, the aero side. I want to do the space side. But a lot of times they're so interconnected. <laughs> so it, it's not even good to take that approach. So I would say where everyone's at, uh, in your career, in school, just really keep an open mind. And as long as you have the right attitude and good intentions, it's never bad to talk to someone in, in an effort to learn more. Yeah, def definitely agree. My experience is the first, the first something, internship job, whatever, always tends to be the hardest, right? And after that, you have something to talk about, whether you liked it or not, you learned what you like, you learned what you don't like, and you wouldn't know that unless you had that experience or had that conversation. So I totally agree. Um, Derek, similar, looks like we had a question in the chat about if you want kind of a non-core engineering role, but you're in engineering school, how do you go about trying to get into like a consulting or another type job um, when that's not your current academic experience? Yeah, um, this is where you tell the story. Uh, so uh, my particular story, as I mentioned during introduction, just briefly, again, is, is I was, I had been dreaming about being an air in being an aerospace, being an aerospace engineer, uh, ever since I was about eleven years old, I remember meeting a civil engineer and asking him about it at my at my sixth grade job fair, um, career fair we had. Uh, and um, as I made my way and had gotten an opportunity from Boeing to go work on the space station at that time. I was interested in systems engineering, and I, I uh, at job fairs, as I met folks at U of I that were coming to campus, I asked a lot of them, did they have their master's degree, and did they have it in engineering, did they have it in business, and that, after I spoke to a number of them, that led me to go and get my MBA, and then eventually I, I realized that um, my passion started to, what I really enjoyed um, was problem solving, and I enjoyed helping uh, companies address some of their complex problems. And so um, I was able to share that story uh, uh, of how engineering gave me a foundation for being able to be a problem solver. So my advice here is, is that if there's another area that you're interested in, engineering more than likely has provided a foundation, whether it's analytics, whether it is uh, just direct problem solving, there, there are components of it. Look at those elements pull those elements out to tell your story, uh, to build towards the direction that you do want to go. I, I just wanted to agree with everything that Derek said. I also went into consulting after I uh, graduated from U of I. The big bonus of your engineering education is your critical problem solving skills uh, and your analytical skills. And those can be applied really to any industry, uh, especially in consulting where you're kind of problem solving all these projects over the course of, you know, maybe two to nine months, depending on the length of the of the project. And I, again, just like what Derek said, know your story. You know, I didn't want to design an antenna on a on a like vertical tail of an F-16 for 10 years, which is I know what some people do. That just wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to get a big picture and see what the industry was like and get a really broad education of everything that was going on. So just be able to verbalize, you know, why you want to go into consulting and why you feel like your engineering skills are applicable to consulting or whatever your uh, non-engineering role is. Perfect. Looks like there's a couple people interested in, you know, if I haven't had a leadership experience or if I haven't had an internship, what are my chances if I'm going up against students that have had multiple internships or have had a leadership experience before. Um, curious about what approach you guys would take if that were your scenario. You know, I participate in organizations, but I'm not the boss, or I haven't had that that real real world quote unquote experience. How do you handle that when you're talking to a recruiter and applying for these positions? I would say I don't look for leadership experience until I'm hiring a mid-career person. If I'm hiring an entry-level person or an intern, 
I don't care that much about what your leadership experience is because it's, it's going to be very different from what the real world is. I care that you're active. I care that you're engaged. I care that you're passionate about something. Um, if I'm interviewing someone for an entry level job and one person has had one internship versus two internships, I mean, that's not going to matter so much five years down the line. It, it certainly helps. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to have those internships. But um, when you're hiring for like one internship or an entry level job, the number of internships you have doesn't really matter. I want to see that you've uh, spent your time in a way that's interesting and advances yourself and uh, has allowed you to learn, right? I care about your audacity, your audacity to learn and your passion and your commitment um, for these types of jobs. So don't let other people's accomplishments or their number of internships uh, affect uh, your confidence and your ability to go after these positions. All right, I don't know, Derek or Alfred, if anybody else wants to weigh in on that one. I'm trying to catch all the questions here, not miss anybody. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, was it that the same? I've got a little bit of a, a bad connection on my end. So it, it was it the same question that Jenny answered? Yeah, that's correct. Just about, you know, if you don't have leadership okay. experience or yeah. an internship. I, 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 I agree with what Jenny said, but what I wanted to highlight is notice that in her answer, when she said, I'm looking for for you're passionate about uh, something that you're, you're um, uh, there may be something in your studies. Again, this goes to your story. So a lot of people say like when you have a resume, they don't wanna look for big breaks in a resume. Now you're just starting off your professional career. So people wanna know that, how did you spend your time during the summer? Were you, were you sitting around waiting to see if, you know, if leaves fall off trees in the summer or were you passionate about something? And back in the old days, they used to say that if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So what are you standing for? You can be passionate about your community. You could be passionate about studies. You could be passionate about helping out your family, but be able to tell your story. So what were you doing during that time? Yeah, and I think a really important piece of that when I do interviews for either full-time or internship positions is details, right? So if you have the time to tell someone, I, you know, everyone's resume says very generic things like supported the integration of the radio on this F-35, right? Well, that sounds really cool. There's a lot of words in there that are exciting, but what did you specifically do, right? What does supported mean? Did you, did you turn the wrench? Um, you know, did you draw the drawing? Did you do the analysis? Um, that's what I, you know, the people that stand out to me are the people that can talk very specifically about what they did. I can tell they're excited about it. What, and they can tell me what the outcome was. You know, the outcome was I got to go to see the flight test and the specific bolt that I did the analysis on worked, right? It flew or whatever the case may be. Um, so I think, you know, the resume tends to be a little more generic sometimes. Being able to speak passionately about the details of what you did, whether you were a leader or not, is super important. Um, kind of switching gears just a little bit. We had a question about uh, negotiation once you've gotten, oh, Derek, you're on mute. Sorry, Samantha, if I could just add, there's something that you said there that, that leadership is important, yes. And I agree with Jenny, that gets developed in time. And some of you are leaders now and we'll be able to share some of that. But, but in the professional space, it all evolves. What they're also looking for though, is they're looking for a team player. So when you hear Samantha saying, you know, what did you do? It's, you know, the, to pull on that a little bit more, it's what was your role on that project, on that team? Right, so you may not have had the internship, but you may have worked on a project during the school year. Talk about that. Talk about your role on it. Talk about the outcomes of the team, as well as the outcomes of some of the challenges you may have faced on your role and how you overcame them. Use that as your internship. Use that project if you haven't had an internship. Sorry, Samantha. No, all good. Um, lots of good questions here. Uh, there was one about negotiation once you've gotten that job or internship. How do you approach that if you got an offer you like and if you got an offer you didn't like? Um, whoever wants to try that one out. So I had a friend call me the other day, uh, last year actually. He was applying for a job at Netflix. 
And he calls me and he says, I got really close to my, he goes, I, I want to work at Netflix. And he goes, and they got, they're really close to my dream offer. But he said, they're so close. I want to ask them, would they offer more? Now, I told him, are you willing to walk away if they don't give you what you need? And in his case, he was. In your case, you want to have at least multiple offers so that you have a backup position that you're comfortable with. The second thing I said to him is, is what you want, is it, is it, is it reasonable? Are you asking for a number that's unreasonable? Now, in many cases, you guys are all starting off. So you want to have done your homework and know that the offer that they're giving you is a, is, is a reasonable offer. But for those of you who, who want to push the limits, like my, my friend wanted to, he said, yes, it's a, he said, what I'm asking for is reasonable. There is, the, there is benchmarking that shows that the salary I'm looking for is reasonable. I coached him to say, in his case, to Netflix, Netflix is known for hiring the best. Everybody wants to be known for hiring the best. And I told him to go back to Netflix and to tell Netflix, it was his understanding that they were looking to hire the best and he considers himself to be the best and that he was a little surprised. And I think this is maybe bold for folks coming out for the first time for a job. But in his case, he was not, it wasn't his first time. He said, he said, I'm really excited about Netflix, but you had told me you're looking for the best and, and, the, and the salary you're offering me is not representative of that. And he said, I believe this salary is. He called me within 24 hours and they gave him more than he was asking for. So he not only got his mark, he got more than that because they said, you're absolutely right, done. Let's not have this conversation again. Let's get to work. Now, I don't recommend that unless you have, again, you're, you're, if you're graduating, this is your first job, that's a bit bold to do. But doing your homework to understand what is a starting salary, to make it, to, uh, using the, the career center at U of I to, to understand kind of the benchmarks of what is a going salary for the discipline that you're looking for, do that homework. If you see a gap in that, feel free to be able to ask about it, but do your homework. Yeah, I'm gonna, I love agreeing with Derek. I'm gonna agree with him again on what he said <laughs> just now. Um, uh, know your ranges for what is a reasonable starting salary. Um, I would say they're lower for maybe your typical engineering positions, higher if you're gonna be doing consulting, um, higher if you're gonna be doing like software engineering for a tech company. And also understand some positions are going to give you a low starting salary and a big bonus. So understand what their compensation is like. Or if you choose to go to a startup, there's probably going to be equity involved. So you, you need to understand what the compensation package looks like for these different types of positions. So most of the time you're weighing um, starting salary, stock plans, equity plans, and bonuses. So make sure you, you understand those. And uh, again, just like what Derek said, the best negotiation position you can be in is if you have multiple offers. So if you have a dream company that's offering you uh, 80 and you have another company that's offering you 90, you can say, hey, look, I really want to work for you guys, but this other company is offering 90. Um, you know, can you meet me there so I can work for you, which is, you know, what I really want to do. So best, best case scenario, have multiple offers. Um, and whatever you're going into, make sure you understand the compensation package. Uh, some of them can be difficult, especially if you're not familiar with the contracts and what they look like. So that's why you have resources like the Career Center and utilize them if, uh, if your job has more complex compensation packages than maybe a typical company. Yeah, I, just to add to that, I think especially, you know, coming directly out of school, you're not going to have that direct experience that you can use to kind of gain some leverage in certain areas. So doing your research is the most important thing, in my opinion, coming right out of college. Um, so, you know, if you're getting a systems engineering role at, I don't know, Northrop Grumman, you know, you can, you can look that stuff up at on Glassdoor and you can use that as a reference. And I would recommend that you do that. Um, looks like some more good ones that came in. So um, going back to talking to recruiters and company representatives, if you've had a scenario where you failed at something or didn't do the best job, 
is that worth bringing up when you're talking to someone? Um, I would say yes, because um, hopefully you grew out of it, right? Um, if you didn't and you, you just continue to spiral down, maybe don't bring that up. But my opinion is absolutely, it, those are the best stories to tell um, because believe it or not, the person you're talking to has also failed at something and they can probably go, oh yeah, I did that once. Um, I, I think that's worth doing if it tells a story, right? If it gets back to you know, who you are as a person and how you reacted out of that challenging situation. Um, Let's see, this is a tough one, right? So the international students, um, sometimes employers don't wanna sponsor work visas um, or they might only have certain roles for um, international students. Uh, anyone here wanna to try to address uh, kind of navigating that, that field? Uh, I just wanna say that it is really difficult in the aerospace industry to be an international student, absolutely. Um, I would say to try to go for more of the commercial companies, it's going to be really, really difficult, if not impossible, to get a company that has a strong defense present, strong defense presence, um, because for most of the time you have to be a U.S. citizen for those. But try going commercial um, and try to be in uh, some of the fields that are really, really competitive and be in software, the software engineering side or just in job areas where there's a really high need and try to go on the commercial side. Um, we are in an era now where there are um, more commercial space companies if you are trying to go in on the space side and there's lots of commercial aerospace companies. Uh, so try to go in that direction and try to go in some of those really high need job areas. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, uh, so from my experience, like I, I do have colleagues uh, who are on H1B. Um, I think there are FBA analysts, uh, perhaps master's or PhD degrees. I'm not trying to say that you should get uh, you know, um, master's or PhD just for that, but you know, trying to um, find the specialties that, that you you probably get more uh, or better chance to have the sponsorship than uh, you know, uh, fresh you know, I know, I know like design engineer or uh, you know, entry level job. Perfect. I think, I think we've done most of these here. I was going to kind of shift back to following up. So after we've talked to a representative or a recruiter, um, Jenny, wondering if you could comment on what's the appropriate way to follow up uh, with someone after you've had that initial in contact or in person contact with them. Uh, typically, I would recommend following up within 24 hours with an email saying, thank you for your time. I really appreciated the opportunity to meet. Um, mentioning whatever your hook was. Uh, thanks for listening to my story about building the airplane. I really think I could be an asset for your company at your company in this position. Uh, please let me know if you'd be able to introduce me to uh, like a systems engineer like we had spoken about previously. Thank you for your time. You know, keep it short, keep it simple. Uh, remind them what was interesting about you and why you're interested in them. And then uh, leave an action item uh, if they're gonna give you an introduction or um, Maybe you can be proactive and say, hey, I, you know, I saw that this uh, job was up on the website and I uh, applied for it. Let me know if you have any advice for the application, something like that. Um, so highly recommend following up within 24 hours. Keep it short, keep it simple, and you know, make sure you leave something memorable. Uh, hopefully you told a good story and had your good hook and you can remind them of what it is. Uh, and uh, make sure your email is well written and very polite. And then that should get set you up uh, for the next meeting. And what do you think if that person doesn't respond, is it um, appropriate to keep that contact info and reach out in a month or a year or two years? Or how do you manage that once you've made that contact with someone? Uh, I think it's okay to reach back out, maybe not rehashing the same thing. Um, you can also, you know, if you, you can always try to get a hold of someone else at the company, maybe, uh, for example, uh, you talk to me at the career fair, but you're not really interested in being in the space electronics um, side, but you are interested in the air structure side over at Collins or the composite side. So you can go on LinkedIn and be like, hey, I had the opportunity to meet Jenny at the career fair. And she mentioned that, uh, you know, that your division might be something I'm more interested in. Would you be willing to talk to me um, about your position so I could learn more? So you can use that person as a jumping off point to 
talk to more people with the company. I don't think it hurts to reach out to the person with new information um, after a period of time, but certainly don't just rehash the same thing and resend them the same email, ho hoping that they'll respond this time. You know, you got to show some some growth or something more interesting or use that as a jumping off point to speak with someone else in the company that you might think is more applicable to your interests. Two good new questions. One was how important is a master's in the engineering field long term? Um, I don't know. Jenny, if you want to start, you've got a master's, right? <laughs> I do have a master's. Uh, I think it depends on what you want to do. Uh, I got a master's and an MBA. Um, I'm not really in a technical engineering field um, in that I'm not a design engineer. Um, it, it is helpful, I think, if you're looking to reset your career, maybe if you were in one thing, but you're really interested in something else, it's nice to go back and revisit those fundamentals and help you pivot to where you want to be. Uh, I think if you're doing something really technical and you want to go further in that specialized field, you can. It's also just a really good continuous learning device. Um, most of my friends have uh, gotten their bachelor's, worked for a few years, understand what they wanted to do and they didn't want to do, and then they went back to grad school uh, a few years later. It definitely gives you a different level of appreciation for school um, when you're paying for it out of your own pocket. And uh, when you're going back after having worked. So I definitely advocate for uh, getting some real world, real world experience um, after your bachelor's to your master's. That being said, you forget a lot of math. I was really surprised. I was great at math. And then I went back to grad school and I was like, how did I ever do this stuff? I don't remember anything. So you gotta keep that in mind. It can, it can be hard to get back into academia when you've had a break. Um, so I would say, you know, it depends. It's a good thing to go back and grease the wheels of your brain and uh, help you can help you pivot careers and can open your eyes to um, some new things uh, that you that you hadn't learned before. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I work in research track. So um, definitely if you're working in research or something that's very technical, it gives you the foundation um, of the knowledge that you need to not only do your job and also to communicate with people, you know, um, you know, I, I've, I've been to you know, technical conferences where people are giving uh, technical presentations. So, and definitely with my master's degree, uh, it helped a lot to understand those technical knowledge and you know how to communicate with other colleagues you know, in your field. Um, I definitely um, agree with Jenny. Um, it, 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 differ, it differs for different, uh, differs for different people, but uh, at least for me, I worked for a few years before getting my master's degree and it really helped me uh found a passion of what i wanted to do and you know going into a master's degree you gotta you gotta have, be passionate right you, you can't just you know you're just trying to get a master's degree for the sake of getting it you really have, want to find your passion and then go pursue a master's degree so uh so yeah uh, i agree i agree um with jenny and um alfred so I, i'm currently doing my master's um and I feel like because I waited a couple of years before doing it, now I get to actually learn about things that are important to me and that I'm passionate about. Um, and then also, you know, we talked about leadership and how, you know, maybe you're not in a leadership role now, but that's something that you could work towards. As I've been working, I realized that that's something that I wanted to do. So I'm also doing a concentration in management and if I didn't have the experience working, you know, maybe I would have done something else and it wouldn't have been what I want to do now. Um, so if you, unless you know exactly what you want to do um, and you want to go into research or do something like that, um, I would definitely think about whether you want to work first and see where your passion lies and then make a decision later. Um, I really like this question. Should you take a job that you don't like <laughs> uh, just to get the experience or, or you know, make the connections with some people in industry? You guys can tell I'm a big fan about, about passion. So if, if, if you're not passionate about getting a master's degree for yourself, then you're not going to approach it with the right mindset. If you're not passionate about a job or an opportunity in front of you, 
you're you're not going to approach it with the right mindset. When when you when you uh, start your professional careers, even more so, especially in this digital world we live in, but but your brand and your reputation are it, not the business card, not the resume. People are going to remember you. People are gonna are gonna say, oh, you know, you know, Derek. Then he used to work at so and so. That that's gonna follow you, just like your digital footprint does now on social media. So you 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 want to always be putting that the the right foot forward every day. Um, so if if it's something that you don't want, I wouldn't I would recommend you not do it because your heart's not going to be in it. That said, though, for for you to be able looking on one side of the door and saying I don't want to do that, I would just say check and make sure that you're looking at it with the right lenses. Uh, and maybe look at the opportunity through multiple lenses. And and if you're on the fence, then you're not asking enough questions about the opportunity. Ask the questions before you make a decision like that, one way or the other. Yeah, uh, I especially agree with Derek's second part. Part of this is you got to keep an open mind. It's how do you know you're not going to like a job before you go into it? There are some times where you can sense it. Maybe you have an interview panel with six people and you don't like any of them. Then that's a red flag. It's like, oh, maybe I don't like the culture at this company and I, I'm not going to be a good fit. But if you read the job description and you're not that interested, uh, you know, there's a lot more behind the job than what's there. Uh, maybe you have coworkers that you like. Maybe you're going to find a great mentor. Maybe it's not the exact specific discipline in aerospace engineering that you envisioned yourself starting with, but you can start out as a as a you know electrical engineer and you can pivot over to systems engineering within that company. Uh, so I would say keep an open mind. If you know you're not gonna like it um, for very specific reasons that you have evidence that you know you won't like it, then like Derek said, don't go into it because if you're gonna have a bad attitude or do it poorly, it's not gonna be a good fit. Uh, but keep an open mind and try to understand that you there are multiple paths you can take to get to the position that you want to be in. You don't have to go you know, ABC to get to that, you know, perfectly planned out career point, you know, in five years, you can take more of a winding path to get where you want to be. And, you know, see along the way, if that's where you want to go to. So I think a lot of this is keeping an open mind and an open spirit and uh, understanding where you want to be long term and how you can take where you're at to see where you're going. I agree with that completely. I, I basically took that winding path. Um, you know, I started out in design, did applications, then did manufacturing. And the way I took it is I, I had an open mind with it and I figured that I could learn. And as I work, I could figure out where I need to go, where my next step should be. So, you know, maybe, you know, you want to be in aerospace, um, but you're not working on a specific system or component that you want to work on. Use that experience and learn as much as you possibly can. And then you can figure out your career path that way. I, I would also say, you know, when Jonathan was talking earlier, he he talked a lot about his time at United. And some folks think about, oh, I'm going to take an, another job. And, and they assume that that means they have to leave the company that they're at. And Jonathan's experience, he, he's done a lot within United alone. Um, and so a lot of these companies have a lot to offer behind the walls if you're unsure of even that role. So I would even suggest doing an exercise, and I know this might sound a little corny, but if you were to, if as you as you look at these companies, as you look at the offers that you'll be receiving, think, where do I see myself in three years? Don't do it in one year, but where do I see myself in two to three years? And does this company have that? If there's a gap, does this company have the resources that will allow me to get where I, I see myself in 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 three years, or doesn't it? Because these companies are evolving as well. But, but think about, are the tools there? Again, this isn't a layback experience. This isn't grab an inner tube and I'm going to sit on the freaking Nile and I'm just going to go down the river and I'll, everything will be happy land. This is a lean in experience. You're going to have to pick out that, that oar and you're going to have to start rowing. And sometimes you're going to have to grow across the current to get to the, the, the pleasant waters. But are the resources there? Are there oars? Is there training? Do they invest in higher training? Will they invest in me? Ask those questions. Will it get me where I want to be in three years? 
And that target that you pick for yourself in three years, you want to look back on that and say, am I better off now than I was then? And I'm yeah, gonna jump just, in. I apologize, but yeah. I have to I have to head out. Um, uh, Tracy or Courtney, feel free to share my email with any students that are interested. And I look forward to seeing follow up emails in 24 hours from folks that are interested. So uh, it was great to meet everyone. Thank you for joining and enjoy the rest of your evening. All right. Thank you. Jimmy. I, I was going to quickly add for all you seniors. Um, I know that you're going to all of your friends are going to be saying, oh, I got this job offer here and I'm going to be at Netflix next year. Um, you do not have to have a job before you graduate your senior year. And I've had a lot of friends who they took jobs that they didn't want because they felt like they had, uh, you know, this goal that they should have been at by the time June rolls around. Um, but really think about what you're doing. And, you know, like Derek said, you know, think about your three-year plan, your five-year plan, where you want to be. Okay, so I am going to um, jump in here. I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for joining us today. Um, I, great insight. I think our students um, learned a lot. I hope they did anyway, and I hope that um, they will be able to take everything they learned here and apply that at the aerospace uh, engineering industry meetup. So um, I just want to take a quick second to to talk about um, the, the AE industry meetup. So you you all have the students from Women in Aerospace to thank for this event. Um, they're really the ones who came to me, I think it was maybe two or three years ago and, and asked about something like this. And um, at the time it, it was not feasible, um, but it is now. And so we're hoping this is the first of uh, annual event. Um, we'll have to see how it goes, I guess, but we're bringing uh, aerospace engineering companies here to campus um, specifically to talk to you, to our aerospace engineering students. Um, right now we have six different companies signed up and for the students who took the time um, to come here today to listen, to learn, um, to give themselves an edge uh, in this event, you're going to get uh, the perk of being able to come in a half an hour early. So I know that my, um, I think my slide here says uh, 5.30 to 7, but for those of you that attended today, um, you will be able to get in at 5. Hopefully that gives you time with our um, recruiters to, to give your elevator pitch and not just the resume and handshake. Um, so uh, with that, um, we're going to do that over at KIF uh, in the basement there. It'll be September 22nd, so you've got time to get your resumes together. You've got time, you know, to work on your elevator pitch. Um, I'm sure uh, the alums that are on with us today, if you have questions that you want to follow up while you're preparing those materials, we'll connect you with people who can help you figure that out. Um, and and walk into the AE industry meetup ready to uh, shake some hands and hopefully make some moves on your career. So um, did we else want to add anything about that? Tracy has has been key in developing this program uh, as well. So Tracy, if you want to jump in with anything, um, please do. I would highly encourage all of you to attend. Um, <clears throat> we've been working on the alumni board and we did some work with some students, particularly seniors last year. And um, one of the feedbacks, not only out of WIA, but out of them was really giving aerospace students the opportunity to meet aerospace companies. So this is not a campus-wide, college-wide event. This is specifically for those of you in the aerospace engineering program. Um, so we've worked really hard to bring in companies um, across the industry. So you'll see everything from airlines to propulsion um, and a great cross section. So um, take advantage of the fact that it's for you um, and it's only for aerospace engineering students. Um, so as you have questions, panelists, myself, um, anyone else, 
please feel free to, free to reach out, but I highly encourage all of you to attend. We're really looking forward to giving you this opportunity. We think it'll be awesome for you. So we have a question in the chat about the companies. Um, yes, we will be publishing those companies as they um, are confirmed. I can tell you that right now, United Airlines will be there, um, Rolls-Royce, Frasca International, Flight Safety International, and CU Aerospace. Um, they, we do have a sixth one that um, is going to join us. And as soon as they confirm that, I will, uh, I will publish that as well. We'll be doing digital signage and things like that around Talbot. So as we get more companies, we'll we'll continue putting those logos up so that you um, you know who will be there and you know who you need to go research so that you understand who you're talking to. All right. Do we have any other questions? Okay, so um, if not, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I especially want to thank our panelists again and um, Samantha for always jumping in um, wherever she is. I think she's at the airport uh, today. So um, join us for the next Illini Aero Connections. You can watch your email um, for when that will happen. Um, but uh, we hope to see everyone back online for that. And we also hope to see you all at the AE Industry Meetup. Have a great evening.